Hello, everyone. Welcome back to PCC Users Conference 2020. You are in for a treat today. We've got an awesome session coming up. Uh, we will hear from Marissa Maldonado, of a, a senior VP with the Coker Group. She will present her session titled How to Implement Health and Human Services Recommended Security pra Cybersecurity Practices. <laughs> and turn it on over to Marissa. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen over here. Um, I hope that first off, I really appreciate you guys taking your time out of your busy day, helping uh, with your patients and all of your beautiful children. I have a newfound appreciation for you guys right now because I'm officially a pediatric mother with a newborn over here. So I'm drinking my coffee because I have a newborn so I don't sleep anymore. Um, so I uh, have a cup of coffee with me and let's get started over here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Hold on one second. Let me make sure I have my chat up just in case someone needs to reach out to me at PCC. So we are going to make this as entertaining as possible because everyone who does not do cybersecurity probably does not find this nearly as interesting and fascinating as I do. Um, we are, I'm going to be a little bit of a teacher today with homework assignments. We're going to be going through this beautiful handbook, the, the technical volume one. Cybersecurity Practices for Small Healthcare Organizations. It's a fascinating read. So I'm gonna make this 30 page document a little bit more concise and easy to follow for you guys. And I'm hoping at the end of this that you really have some key takeaways that you can immediately implement at your practice. Cause I'm a big fan of if you're gonna spend time with me right now, I want to make sure that you have an action plan right when you get off of this uh, presentation with me. So that's my type A personality coming out being like, we need a plan, and we're gonna execute it. Um, again, so there's gonna be Q&A and networking. So while you're watching, you can join the live session in the UC chat um, and ask the questions organically as they come up. I've said that if at some point when we start going through the practices to implement for this, um, I wanna open it up to conversations organically through the presentation. Um, versus saving all of it at the very end. So our goals are going to be an overview of five common threats, how to implement the 10 technical best practices. And then also at the end, I'm gonna do a little refresher with all of us for protecting our rem remote workforce. Cause I know that's a very applicable thing that's going on right now. Um, as I was joking, as we're in our COVID-19 crisis and I said, we're kind of like in the intermission of it cause we're definitely going to be revisiting it more and more once we come back into the fall season. I always love to start my presentations with this chart. It's always changing because we're always having cybersecurity issues. So this is from this website called Information is Beautiful. And it's just a mapping of all our current cybersecurity data breaches and hacks. And I pretty much, I like to open it up to outside of the medical world as well. I know, you know, we kind of stay in the bubble from time to time when we're talking um, amongst ourselves, but I think it's important for us to look at the bigger picture because we are always using the same passwords and the same accounts and the same Gmail email addresses. So, you know, things happen outside of our bubble that might trickle down and affect us later down in the road. It's a domino effect. It's not just, oh, no one's going to ever attack me. Why? I'm just, you know, a small pediatric group um, in a small town in the middle of America. But it all is an interconnected web. So I always love to just kind of bring this up. This is a fun little website to go to. And on the actual website, if you click on any of these, it'll, it'll give you the, the actual press release and the information of what happened. Um, it's important to look at these things because like I said, like the one at the very top, the DB8151DD, that one is, as you can see, 22 million accounts compromised. Um, and it, that one is like an actual uh, like congregation of data that someone actually organized in order to distribute. 
So they're not even sure exactly where the source of that data was, but it includes personal information. So your information is out there. Um, I always kind of feel like maybe I'm beating a dead horse with it, but always check dark web monitoring because it's gonna be out there and you need to check it from time to time. It's like you check your credit history, check your, check your website footprint with these hacks because your information is in at least one of these, I, I guarantee it. So I wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about cybersecurity and the coronavirus and what has happened with all of this. Um, basically when COVID-19 hit, it was an immediate conversation of, are we gonna see an uptick in attacks? Are we gonna see opportunistic attacks? Or are we gonna see a protection of healthcare because you know, our healthcare are our heroes, they're the front lines and all this, don't disrupt what they're working on. Unfortunately, of course, we have seen an increase in aggressive phishing campaigns across the board. So Google, they had reported an average of 18 million targeted COVID-19 related phishing malware threats per day. So what happened was we had a lot of, um, phishing campaigns and security threats that came in and actually started registering new email domains. Like um, instead of sba.gov, we had sba.gov-19.com. And then those emails were coming. So, so different types of emails to potentially mask and seem like they're coming from a legitimate source. There was an, a reported increase of hack for hire firms creating Gmail accounts spoofing World Health Organization. Um, hack for hire, it, it, what essentially it means, and a lot of these were actually coming from, um, from India, are they're actually organized businesses that are literally hack for hire, where I come in and say, hi, I need a database, and this is the phishing campaign that I want to put out, and you will get 5% of any revenue that comes from this phishing campaign. Thank you very much. And then the hack for hire firm say, okay, great. Well, this is how we're gonna distribute it. And this is the malware we're gonna to attach to the email. So as you can see, it's a very it's a business transaction. There's nothing to um, uh, like dramatic about it as we would think that would be like, I'm in a hooded mask and I'm working in my basement and I'm vigorously hacking away no, it's, it's business transactions. I need to make revenue. We're going to make revenue by um, taking advantage of people who have a little bit of a lack of education or security around their organization. So on the other hand, organized cyber crime groups such as Doppelpamer have specifically come out to say if a medical or healthcare organization is attacked by mistake, they will provide a free decryptor code. Isn't that nice? Um, so that was really very nice of these hacker groups to come out and tell us that they would uh, release um, these, if, if it was a medical or healthcare organization and they weren't going to specifically attack them. But is it really something that actually works in real life? So, Criminals promising to be nice, why this is hard to enforce. So it's difficult to implement in the real world because of external facing IP addresses. So these addresses do not identify a target as a healthcare organization. So what does that mean? So as you can see in my pretty little chart over here. So these are what we refer to as internal IPs, right? So this is what's associated every single computer, phone, printer at your office is going to have an IP and those are internal, right? And so that's how your environment communicates with each other. So I like to compare an IP address to a phone number, right? So if I need to call the front desk, I'm going to dial extension 1015. I should know this extension by heart, but I'm going to dial my extension and it's going to connect me to her and she's going to pick up the phone and say, hello. So the same thing with an IP address internally. If I want to go print, my computer is going to say, hey, 192.168.0.115. I think that's what it is over here. 
I would like to print to you. I'm going to send this information to you. Okay, cool. So that's how things move around inside the office. So the external IP, as you can see, is my address to the outer world from my, from my, from my inside. So my external IP is usually going to be assigned by my router, which usually is coming from my internet service provider or my firewall, if I have a firewall at my office. And that is my outside telephone number to the world to come connect with me. So that's how I say, if I type in google.com and then Google, I say, okay, I need to connect to this phone number. And then my external IP goes and finds it and then they come back and then they bring it back onto my computer, but it happens instantaneously. It's quite beautiful how data actually moves in the real world. That's a whole other conversation for another day. Um, external IPs, they are not associated. I keep glancing over here to make sure no one's pinging me at PCC. So excuse me for looking that way, but um, it's not associated with my organization, right? So my, in this description, my 101.56.14.56 doesn't say, hold up, I'm healthcare please don't attack us because we're trying to save the world right now. Um, so why is that hard to implement? Because hackers like to use the theory of numbers, right? The more numbers, the, the bigger the net I cast, the more likely I'm going to get some little fishies in my net and then be able to gobble up some money from them. So, that brings me to a little bit of a history lesson now. Um, now we're in 2020, so 2017 sounds like um, so long ago in our history's past, but never forget the WannaCry 2017 ransomware attack. So if you don't recall, this was a ransomware attack that went out and targeted Microsoft Windows operating systems that had not deployed security patch updates. This was not a targeted healthcare attack. So this was never the intention of WannaCry, but what did it do? As it cast its super, super large net around the world, they caught the National Health Services hospitals that crippled their medical systems in England and Scotland for quite some time. Um, it definitely would made national news. And the reason I just bring that up is always be safe, always be protected, always be thinking about cybersecurity because the net has no, you know, it has no mask, it has no filter of staying away from pediatric groups. Um, again, I always like to bring up the, the, the history of um, when the Boston Children's Hospital got attacked. There's all sorts of things of medical groups getting crippled by cybersecurity incidences. Um, and it's never their true intention to do it. So even though if you hear, oh, hackers are gonna be nice and they're not gonna attack us, it's, it's still a vulnerability. So here's some types of COVID-19 phishing campaigns. Actually, we implemented some phishing campaigns over here and we've done some COVID-19 ones as well, um, just to keep people on their toes. So Fraudulent emails regarding capitalizing government stimulus packages, impersonating government organizations like the World Health Organization asking for donations or installing mal malware. malware, they're so nice. Impersonating SBA to gather personal information. I actually got one of those, it was a good one. And also PPE and other medical supply chain emails. Hey, we have some in stock, come give us your money and then we'll send you some and then you never get anything. Or download this app on your computer and then we can do real time inventory for you and make your life easier and make sure everyone has their PPP, PPE and your life make is simpler and then you find out you have malware on your environment. So, I wanna transition and talk about the technical volume one, cybersecurity practices for small healthcare organizations. And I'm going to be using an analogy over here. And um, basically we're gonna talk about how not to catch COVID-19 or a cold or a flu. 
and talk about the different types of cold and flus, AKA the different types of threats. So do you stop washing your hands when you are not in the cold or flu season? The answer is no, I'm always going to wash my hands. So back to the conversation of, well, healthcare clients are not being targeted right now. Well, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop washing my hands, which also for that analogy, doesn't mean I'm going to stop protecting my environment. So the health industry cybersecurity practices, also abbreviated as HICCUP, H-I-C-P, or HICCP, I don't know, I like to call it HICCUP. Um, here's a little, I'm gonna go in a little bit of a boring uh, reading over here. It's a common set of voluntary consensus-based and industry-led guidelines, best practices, methodologies, procedures, and processes to achieve three core goals. Goal number one, cost effectively, who doesn't love that? Cost effectively reduce cybersecurity risk for a range of healthcare organizations. Number two, support the voluntary adoption and implementation of its recommendations. And number three, ensure on an ongoing basis that content is actionable, practical, and relevant to healthcare stakeholders of every size and resource level. Um, so what we're going to go through today is there's two of them, right? There's um, medium, well, there's three, there's medium, large, small, and like hospital systems. So we're going to focus on small because small actually uh, covers a wide range, even um, super groups and multiple locations. And my, my smaller one provider practice. Um, and why I really want to bring this to you guys as PCC uh, clients is that we wanna make sure that we're providing you some cost-effective guidelines for you to protect your environment because the last thing that you want is a security issue or breach that's gonna be very costly or potentially um, put you dead in the water where you have to stop operations to, to remediate. So, we're going to go through threats, vulnerabilities, impacts, and practices. So here's where I become a little bit of a teacher over here. So here are my analogies. And for threat, vulnerability, impact, and practices, that's what those, those four different terms are throughout this conversation of this guideline. So threat would be COVID-19. My vulnerability would be I have a weak immune system I don't wash my hands. I am in the vulnerable age group and I'm in crowds. So I'm around a lot of people. Um, I am not adhering to uh, social distance um, for work related reasons or for whatever. My impact is that I get sick. So I get COVID-19, I have coronavirus and um, I have to be in quarantine at this point. So my practices would be, I'm gonna socially distance. I'm gonna wash my hands. I'm gonna wear a mask. So what we're going to go through for the next a couple of minutes as threats and practices. So we're gonna talk about what are the different types of threats? So in this analogy, what are the different types of virus strains that are out there? And what are the different practices? So what are the different things I can do right now to not get sick? All right, so my five common threats, my five common diseases, my five common virus strains. One, email phishing attacks. Two, ransomware attacks. Three, loss or theft of equipment or data. Four, insider, accidental, or intentional data loss. Five, attacks against connected medical devices that may affect patient safety. So in phishing campaigns, so in email phishing attacks, right? That was exactly what I was talking about from earlier of what is the one thing that we've seen that has impacted everyone once COVID-19 hit? It was the email phishing attacks. So that's going to be 
a wide range of things, but it's the easiest way for them to get into your environment. So if anyone that is on this conference call that is still using free Gmail for their emails at their practice, please stop doing that because of this, because it's the number one threat. Um, and we'll go into the practices here in just a second. So that's why I brought up stop using your free email accounts for work. Um, ransomware attacks. So ransomware attacks are, we all are very familiar with those. I hold your hostage data. I hold your data hostage and you got to pay me money and then I'm going to give it back to you. Loss or theft of equipment or data. That can be from many, many different things. That could be one of your doctors lost a laptop or someone broke into your practice and they took all, of, they took some computers. Um, we have been part of remediation for groups that has been devastating um, from the fees component from OCR. Uh, luckily right now they're, they're, being, they're being nice um, because of everything that's going on. So they have actually come out and said, we're gonna, we're gonna back up and let you guys do your thing and save the world right now, um, but they will be back. Um, the loss or theft of equipment is often overlooked and there's certain things that you need to make sure you have in place so that if you lose a laptop or if you lose a desktop, or if even if you lose a phone that doesn't have uh, encryption on the phone, you have a clear path of how to remediate and you're not gonna have OCR knocking on your door about it. Um, insider accidental or intentional data loss. So I have a rogue employee and I delete a bunch of data. Uh, luckily, you're most likely going to have really good backups um, in the event, because I know PCC will manage your backups and your data um, that's being hosted on their server. Um, but it could be that the data was deleted a while ago and you didn't even know about it until you're looking for it six months from now. And at that point, you don't have that historical data from six months ago. Um, there's all different ways for data loss. Um, you could have your IT accidentally reformatting something and deleting your data, which we've seen before. Um, all sorts of different creative ways for data loss. Attacks against connected medical devices that may affect patient safety. This is not gonna be too relevant for you guys, um, but this would be in the event like all the uh, different types of modules. Um, if I have like a, a heart pacemaker that I'm wearing, um, those type of medical devices that if they got compromised, it could potentially um, be detrimental to uh, the patient. So 10 technical best practices to mitigate threats. So this is where I really wanna kind of open it up to questions as well as we go through them. So um, here's my boring note. These best practices recommended are in alignment with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which consists of five concurrent and continuous functions that constitute the cybersecurity life cycle for an organization, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. All right, cool. I said, I said my spiel, so now you know it's, it's legit. Um, so here are my 10 technical best practices. So again, in reference to my analogy from before for practices is for COVID-19, I am going to wash my hands. So I'm back at the office over here and we have all sorts of educational flyers all over the place of proper ways to wash our hands. I'm going to wear a mask um, when I'm in the elevators in case I have to be in close proximity with someone and I am going to adhere to social distancing as much as possible. So those are my, tech, my, my three medical or patient best practices to mitigate my threats of COVID-19. So here are my 10 best practices to mitigate cybersecurity threats. So we've got email protection systems, endpoint protection systems, access management, data protection and loss prevention, asset management, network management, vulnerability management, incident response, medical device security, and cybersecurity policies. So 
we're going to go through these and what I really want to do and kind of, um, I wish I could see all of your beautiful faces in real time, but I'm very much grateful that we are able to do this virtually. Um, I really want you to take a moment, grab a notepad. And as we go through these, I want you to determine a, I'm good to go on this one or B, once we're off of this call, I'm going to bring these people into the conversation and we're going to do a couple of easy to implement practices in order to make sure that we are hitting all 10 of these bullet points in our practice. So again, so this is how we're going to go through this practice and we're going to, we're going to learn how to wash our hands through this. So for the next 15 minutes, we're going to dive into this component of it. All right, email protection systems. So in this component, there are three key sub points to do. One, email system configuration. Two, education. Three, phishing simulation. So I want you to write down one key step you can implement today to improve your email protection system. So Marissa, what would that be? All right, step one, are you using your free Gmail. The reason why that is a concern is because I'm not going to have the proper filtering system in that. I'm not going to be able to layer some of the more like business security stuff that's out there. And it's pretty cheap to get um, from directly from the vendor. You can have a conversation with PCC, um, many different ways of, of getting this done. But um, your email system configuration matters. Uh, there's different things to do. Like for instance, if I have a domain, so if my domain, for instance, is pokergroup.com, in my configurations and having a conversation with my IT team, I want to make sure that we do not allow spoofing of my domain. What that means is no one can come in and use pokergroup.com to pretend to be me, right? And you see how that can be a problem because I could potentially get an email from someone from cokergroup.com and I look at the address and I say, it's from cokergroup.com. Of course, I'm going to uh, change your routing information for your payroll. Like, sure, of course, it's the owning physician of my practice. Of course, I'm going to do it. So there's different components within the email system configuration. So one of the questions that you could take away is go to your vendor who helps you with your email and say, hey, can you let me know what type of configurations do we have on our email system right now that protects us from email security threats? Another thing that we can do within their email system configuration, which is actually at this point a standard best practices requirement is turning on multi-factor authentication, also abbreviated as MFA or dual authentication, whatever you want to call it. So essentially it means that if I log into a computer, um, obviously there's ways to save the authentication. So I'm not doing it every single time, but when I log in for this first time, I get an annoying little pin on my phone as in with my dog. Um, and I have to actually enter in that pin in order to get in, right? So dual authentication, one, two. That needs to happen without question. Um, different organizations, so really your two biggest contenders are um, Microsoft 365 and G Suite. Those are the two power players uh, for email. Um, for business business email, um, I know specifically like with Microsoft 365, if you want to be a partner of Microsoft 365, managing multiple tenants, every single tenant now must have this turned on because it's such a huge vulnerability. It is the easiest way to get into an environment, right? Because we are checking our emails all day long. It's what we do. So number two is education. So education is stuff like this. Um, it is sending out our annual cybersecurity training for all of our staff to let them know these are the things that you need to watch out for in email protection systems or even other things like um, 
if there's anything that involves changing payroll information, you must verify that payroll information with a phone call to talk to that person at the practice. Even if they're right down the hall from us, I'm gonna pick up the phone and say, hey, I was just making sure and verifying that you wanna change your routing information. So all of those different types of components and education and taking a look at where, where, are, those, where are those potential for um, a, a, a breach. And then phishing simulation. Um, this is super easy to do and super fun to do. Well, some people think it's super fun to do, but very simple. I'm gonna pretend to be a malicious actor and I'm gonna fish all of the employees here that have email addresses and I'm gonna know which ones clicked on it. I'm gonna know which ones put in the passwords. I'm gonna know which ones downloaded the software on the email. And then I'm gonna to go to them and say, by the way, you were tested and you failed and let's have a five minute conversation to train you on looking more closely at these emails so you can determine if they're malicious or not. Um, I know I spent, spent a minute on this slide talking through this, but it, it really is um, one of the most important things. And, and there, there's a reason why this is number one for our practices. If, if there's anything that you take away from today, um, I would hope that this one, our email protection is the number one. So again, going back to our analogy of how do I, what are my best practices to prevent COVID-19 or from just getting sick in general? Just wash your hands. That's the number one practice. So same thing with email. Just protect your email. That's the number one practice. When you do anything, just do this. So endpoint protection systems. This is uh, not as interesting as email. But um, so endpoint is in reference to your computer, the thing that I have right now, my, my phone, my iPad, my tablets, uh, you know, all of my fun things, my endpoints. Endpoints, anything that has an internal IP. Remember I was talking about before with internal IP. So endpoint protection and basic endpoint protection, um, that is going to be antivirus. Make sure that I'm using antivirus. Make sure that it's not expired. It doesn't have to be that expensive, um, but it's super important to make sure that, I'm having, that I have it deployed. Other things that I can do with endpoint protection system is making sure that I have some sort of remote monitoring agent on it. Most of the time, your um, IT provider should be providing that. So just ask them, what are you using for endpoint protection for my environment? Let them answer that question and then you can sleep a little bit better at night. So this one's pretty straightforward. Access management. So for access management, this is a physical component and a data component. Um, access management. Do I manage how people access my environment? Now, I know for a fact that since you are a PCC client, your access management is being done to get to the PCC server, to get to that data. You have a log into that. Now, another question is, do you have a password that's unique to each individual person on your actual computers, right? So I wanna make sure that even just getting onto my computer, there is some sort of access management to get on and off of it. When someone leaves my practice, am I making sure that this account is being removed from my system so that they can't get in anymore? Am I making sure that my access management is unique passwords for every single one of my users, right? Am I just using one password to get into all of my computers? Am I as the practice manager or am I as the owning physician, does everyone have my password to get into my, to get, it, to get into my computer? Because it's easier, right? So I don't have to log in my password 20 times a day. Mm, it's really important that we have individual unique passwords um, into our computers. And one of the things that you guys can really look into is um, I know there's always a conversation that doctors get really frustrated with having to type in passwords all the time. And then you say, so you're telling me I'm going to have to put in a password into my computer and then I'm going to have to put a password to get into PCC server. 
that's a lot of passwords. That's 525 clicks on my keyboard that I have to do every week times 52 weeks. That's this much time. And then that means I'm wasting this much time every year on password entry. I've had these conversations many times, as you can tell. Um, there are different ways for doing like biometric passwords, right? So I just put my thumbprint, my fingerprint and boop, I can actually do it It's built into my laptop. So technology is out there to start implementing this and actually on the new laptops as well, you can do biometrics. So I can just scan my face and boop, like cell phones, or I could just do a four digit pen. So moral of the story is there are different ways for us to ensure that access management is not um, a, a, a thorn in uh, the heel of our owning physicians or any of the practicing physicians as well, but it's still very important for us to do access management. So if you have any takeaway from this is how am I logging into my computers and what are we doing when an employee leaves? And how many people know my password to get into my computer? So our next practice is data protection and loss prevention. So this one's pretty easy. Um, again, this was us talking about loss prevention. Someone loses a laptop or someone accidentally deletes stuff. Um, it's pretty straightforward policy procedures. Um, it, it's kind of comes up a lot for policy and procedures. The PCC has some really great vendors out there who will help guide you through this. Um, you don't even have to make it that complicated either if you wanna be um, a little bit more mindful of your expenditure to do this. But step one, are my laptops encrypted? So I ask that question to IT. Are my desktops encrypted? Are my cell phones encrypted? Step two, I guess that's step four. <laughs> um, what are my policies and procedures around someone losing something? Do they have to report it? What do we do once it gets reported? Are we storing data on these actual computers or are they all in the cloud? Or are they all on the server um, that we're connecting to? Um, Many times people will be like, well, there's no patient information on this because it's also stored on the server. Um, but I like to say patient information is like um, uh, li li little ants. They find their way into the tiny crevices of your house. You can tell I'm, ha I'm having an ant problem in my house right now. Uh, they, they find their way into the crevices of the house without you even knowing it. And they just, they're just kind of everywhere. So that's like patient information, even with emails and stuff. They're it sneaks in somewhere. Someone, someone pulled a report and there's an Excel spreadsheet that's sitting on their desktop right now and it's just there and it has patient information on it. Um, so do I have policies around data protection and loss prevention? And do I have procedures on what happens in the event that I have an incident where we have lost data. And also, am I doing some sort of restorative backups? How am I, how am I being, a, what can I do to restore my data? But like I said, the good news is that's one of the really awesome things about being with PCC is they take care of a lot of that. But we wanna talk, we wanna think about those tiny little ants that I was talking about that kind of just sneak into places that they shouldn't be, that there shouldn't be in, patient information. Asset man, management. So inventory, procurement, decommissioning. Am I keeping real-time data of the inventory, all my laptops and all of my, all of my end nodes, right? All the things that have an internal IP. Am I keeping track of all of those? Procurement, how am I purchasing those? I'm not buying them used, right? No, 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 don't do that. Um, and what happens when I procure them? I'm probably gonna give them to my IT company and they're gonna clean it up and they're gonna put all the things on it. They're gonna make the access management. And then the most important question is how am I decommissioning my computers later? Um, I'm not just throwing them away. I'm not just donating them, right? What am I doing with my hard drives when I'm done? Cause again, back to my little tiny ants all over the house. 
Same thing with decommissioning computers. Really important that you have a pretty strict policy and procedures in place for doing proper decommissioning, right? Um, we don't wanna be one of those use case studies of I sent the printer back and then came to find out there's a hard drive in the printer and it had all of this data and I got fined with $500,000 from OCR because I lost a bunch of patient information. So very important for decommissioning. I would recommend um, finding like a local electronic recycling facility in your area. Um, most of the time they'll actually, uh, back in the day, they will actually let you visually watch shredding of um, hard drives so that you can confirm destruction. But some, sometimes nowadays they'll actually just give you a certificate of destruction. Most of those electronic recycling companies, I find it a little tough in the Northeast, but most of the time you shouldn't have to pay for it because what they're doing is you're taking all of that metal and they're reselling it. But because of all the tariffs and everything is changing in our global economy, um, that business has gone down a little bit. So you might have to pay a, a little fee. So I would personally say, gather your decommissioned laptops, pull those hard drives out, pull those hard drives out. If you don't want to spend money on it, lobotomize them. So just drill a hole through them and then wait till you accumulate a, a little, a big pile and then do like a big um, electronic recycling for them. Network management. So this is a little bit more nerdy, but also very important to have this conversation with your IT, your IT team. Network segmentation. So what network segmentation means is, think of my network, here's two cities, right? Here's city A, here's city B. And there is a highway that connects them, right? If I am having an issue at city B, I think this one would be, if I'm having an issue at city B, then if I have network segmentation, I have designated roads that are separate and I can just shut that road off and isolate the problem, isolate the security issue, isolate the flood, whatever type of analogy that you want. If I did not have network segmentation, city A and city B to get to them would be just this big white beautiful green pasture between the two cities and you just run amok and zigzag all the way over there and you could go all over the place. It's very nice. It's very simple. It's very cheap. It's very easy. But what happens when I need to isolate and stop traffic going from one place to another in order to protect the environment because I'm having a security incident? I can't do it anymore, right? I can't just, you know, block that entire field. It's going to be a true devastation to my environment. I'm going to have to um, go dark, right? Then I won't be able to keep operating as, as needed. Um, network segmentation is pretty simple, especially with smaller clients and smaller practices. It doesn't take too much. It's very important to do it on the front end, especially if you're growing, because if you don't do it on the front end and then you got to do it after you've grown to a certain point, it becomes a lot more expensive to do that, right? Just think of the same analogy of the cities. If I'm already moving back and forth, moving back and forth. It's really annoying to do highway construction traffic. I'm sure we all understand that. So the same idea. I do not want to be doing construction traffic when I have a lot of data moving back and forth because I've grown and I have multiple locations. Um, physical security and guest access. So that's pretty straightforward. Do I have a security system at my office? Do I have a process for how guests access my network? wireless and most PCC clients, your wireless is managed through them. So keeping those segmented and intrusion prevention. So intrusion prevention is basically how do I prevent the intrusion from ever happening in the first place? Again, a lot of you guys have management through the edge with PCC, which is also a really great thing for scalability and for cost management. Um, those firewalls, do the intrusion prevention. Vulnerability management. So again, this is just the conversation of what am I doing to identify my different vulnerabilities. Um, this really kind of goes into my policies and procedures as well. Um, and it's pretty straightforward on this one. Um, you know, if you go into my fancy little, not my fancy little document, but this, this workbook, 
um, it'll kind of show you a little bit from the vulnerability management, but it really kind of trickles into us looking at all of the different ones. Like if I have intrusion prevention in place, that's how I'm managing that specific vulnerability pinpoint. So sit down with your group, spend the 30 minutes with them and identify where are different points of weakness and how do we address it, right? And map it out. Incident response um, and I say ISAC and ISAW or um, participation. So incident response means I have a plan in place for when there is an incident. And I've talked about this in other uh, presentations, an incident, an event, a breach. So an incident basically means there's something that was very interesting that happened that involved my cybersecurity or my privacy and my security. Um, and I'm just looking into it. What do I do? What are my next steps? We're never going to use the word breach because breach has a different legal connotation to it. So what, what are we going to do with this? Have I done a tabletop at my office? Those are great to do. They're kind of fun. Um, it's basically role playing. So it's role playing what our incident responses will be. And then the participation in ISAC or ISAO um, is basically, am I getting notifications and I'm participating in these groups that are letting us know what different type of vulnerabilities are happening. Most of the time your IT team should be doing that because you have enough on your plate and they're the ones that are working on the back end of, oh, this new vulnerability came out. We need to make sure that we're patching the computers in order to patch, you know, uh, close up that vulnerability. Medical device security, we talked about it a little bit uh, uh, earlier in this presentation, but again, am um, I looking at all the different medical devices that are potentially vulnerable? Um, and what are we doing about it? Are we talking to that vendor and making sure that patching is happening? Um, are we making sure we're using the latest and greatest so that they don't have vulnerabilities on them? Um, not as applicable for you guys, but I'm um, still worth thinking about. Um, back to the policies, cybersecurity policies. So it's really important to have these. It's not fun. It's not interesting. Well, okay. Some people would think this is really fun because some people do this 100% of the time. I personally kind of, it falls, you know, I like the things moving. I like the data, I like the analogies. Um, but the policies are super important as well. So this kind of backs up everything that we've talked up leading to this moment. Um, go through your policies. Do you have policies? If you don't, it's okay. Um, it's very easy to get them implemented. You don't have to think too much through it. Like I said, there's a lot of organizations that can help you through this right off the bat. Um, it's just, it's super important to have these, especially nowadays with OCR, that's no longer nice to have. It's, you have to have. Um, so you'd much rather have them now when you don't need them versus later when you do, because it's probably going to be super expensive because A, you're going to have to spend money to get it done quickly. And B, you might get slapped with a fine because you don't have them in place already. So go ahead and get those done. So I want to, I've got just a couple more minutes over here and then I wanna open it up if we have any Q and A. Um, but just talking really quick about our remote workforce because I know that this is still an ongoing conversation with everyone just kind of, you know, winging it right now with everything going on with COVID um, and the potential that you maybe your, your billing and your front office, back office might be up at your practice or you might be letting them work remote from home. Um, there's a couple of things that I would recommend. So looking at our cyber security practices, making sure first we have those in place and the computers that they take home with them continue to have those components in place, right? We want to make sure that if they are working from home, they're likely using a laptop that we issued out. That's super important, right? Because I want to make sure that if you're at home accessing the data, we have the same type of endpoint protection. We have all of those components that we have at the office. Um, it's also really important to make sure that that computer that they're using at home, 
No one else is running on that computer later and installing a bunch of fun games that might have malware hidden on them. Um, it's kind of important to have them semi locked down because if I have my laptop and kids install a bunch of fun malware games on my computer and then I come back to the office with an infected computer, I might have some problems depending on uh, what type of security I have at the office. So it's very important to make sure that your work your remote workforce, you have some policies put in place for them um, that will protect you on the back end and make sure that they're not using those computers the way that they shouldn't be used. Um, and, and yeah, and that's pretty much one of the biggest things for it is remote workforce. Um, the other thing that I recommend, but this is a little bit harder to enforce, right? Because I cannot have an imminent domain on your home, but just giving them a little bit of education, right? What type of internet of things do I have at my house? Um, what are all of those fun little apps and smart TVs and things on, on, my, on my home network that can communicate with each other? Because I bring that laptop into my home. That means it is now in this little bubble at home and they can communicate with each other. Remember when I was talking about my internal IPs? I'm going to say, oh, you, hey, internal IP, I'm going to connect with you and send data back and forth. That's what happens at home. And we probably don't have a strict of security um, standards on the back end at our home environment. So if I have a compromised device at home, it could potentially knock on the door of my laptop and become a problem for me. So it's really important to make sure that we are protecting those computers that are going home. Um, while our employees are working from home. So some session takeaways. There's never a good time to ease up on cybersecurity. Um, again, our five common threats for healthcare organizations and the 10 practices to protect your organization and steps for your practice to implement these practices. That's a lot of practices in one sentence. Um, but I'm hoping that you guys have some very clear takeaways that you can go back to your practice and implement. Um, maybe it gets a little repetitive hearing it again and again, but it, like I said, it's a continuous, continuous evolution. And it's always a really good reminder to just take a moment, take a deep breath and have a conversation about your cybersecurity, maybe for an hour, every quarter with your vendor, your IT vendor, and with PCC, they do a lot for protection um, of your environments as well. Um, and just so to make sure that you sleep better at night because you guys have enough on your plate. So cybersecurity should kind of be a, uh, you know, be on auto drive for you guys. So here are some references. This is, I put some bit.ly links on here too. Um, so if you want to write them out, they're a little bit easier to capture. Um, but here are my links um, for the information is beautiful. And this is the link for um, the H HCP document. So the document that I'm holding right here. Um, and if we have some time over here on the back end, if there's no Q&A, um, I'll go ahead and show you that, that, uh, that link. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marissa. This is awesome. You will not find it hard to believe that you elicited some questions. <laughs> um, we threw a couple of polls up as you were talking and for, for sake of interest, um, the five types of threats of those, everyone that answered the poll, 100% uh, of the folks that had had experience with one or more of those threats, uh, email phishing attack was the top answer. 100% of folks had, yep. had had experience or uh, with phishing attacks. Uh, and the other poll that we had is very reassuring. 100% of the folks who answered, does your employee exit policy address disabling access for usernames? 100% said yes. So good. there's there's some good news there. Um, specific questions, however, include, do you have any suggestions for platforms to use or ways that practices can more easily complete their yearly security risk audit? Sure. Um, so it depends on... It, the pricing can range wildly, all right? Um, and that's why I always like to bring it back down um, that one of the things that I've had a conversation even like with, with Chip is they should be very uh, 
achievable for all of you all. Um, most times your IT vendor should be able to run it for you um, where it's just a scan that bloop and it just, it starts rating what your vulnerabilities are and then you do the remediation for it. Um, I would highly recommend that if you're in contract negotiations or if you're in between your, those vendors, make sure that's negotiated into those contracts where it's included that they're actively doing this for you. Um, there isn't necessarily like a go to this website, type in and they plug it in and boop, they scan it. Um, but talk to your vendors about it. Um, I know that I, I don't want to like solicit my services to you guys, but I'd be more than happy to talk to you guys, especially for those smaller groups. Um, it doesn't have to be too complicated. Um, so, and it is important to do, but um, you know, if you're a small practice and someone comes back to you and says, oh, it's going to be $20,000, run quickly, Oof. far, far away. Um, so, yeah, because what happens is they say, do they just check some boxes and they say, oh, your healthcare, let me add a couple zeros to that one. Um, but talk to your IT provider. Um, and if you need some resources, I'd be more than happy to connect um, offline and, and provide those, those resources for you. Awesome. Um, well, yeah. uh, we've got another question. How long should we keep certificates of hard drive destruction on file? Um, I would say best practices, seven years. Um, I, I know that sounds a little intense, but I would tuck it away with my financials over there and just keep them as long as I keep those financials because you never know when something's going to sneak back up and potentially blow up in your face. Um, again, uh, those certificates of destruction, um, are they, sh they better be free. They should be free. Um, if they're not, you shouldn't spend that much money on them. Um, but yeah, keep, keep them as long as you would keep your financials. Cool. And one, uh, a third question that we received is we have both a secure email and secure texting options for the doctors in our office to communicate with each other, but some of the doctors continue to use their own personal devices with PHI. Of course they do. Do you, <laughs> do you have any suggestions that might help convince these docs to use secure email and texting? That's a deep philosophical question, my friend. <laughs> That's a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> I know this practice and they've, they've made efforts at it. They've even gotten agreement from the clinicians and it didn't last. They, it, it, they slipped back into those habits. You know, the only thing that I could say is if they continue doing that and it it's hard for me to answer the question directly because you have to take into the account the culture at that individual practice. But if they continue to use it, I would make them sign off on it where it's an acknowledgement that we have given you this stuff. We recommended you do this. You are still refusing to do it. I need you to sign off of this because if we have an issue with it, like I, as the practice as a whole, we can't fall on the sword for you because we've done everything that we can. Um, you know, you might get a little kicking and screaming on that, but that might be the best way to really kind of reinforce how serious you are on how important this is. Um, and has the dual effect of protecting yeah. you somewhat. Right. A a but again, you are not alone in this struggle for the person who asked this question. Um, I see this a lot. Um, it, it, it's definitely that balance of cybersecurity and don't mess up my workflow. I do my things very specific. And if I had to do two more clicks, I am calculating how long that's going to take me to do it every year. And I'm going to find a creative solution to get to get what I need to get done because their plates are already full. I get it. Yeah. Um, but have them sign off on it. Um, you know, it's important. You can't be, you can't, you can't be all willy nilly with how you're com communicating with patients. Um, Agreed. Well said. That is the end of the questions that we've received up until now. And we're at the top of the hour. Do you have any uh, final ideas or anything else you'd like to share? You know, like I said, you know, with those questions, it, there, there's definitely a little bit of component of the culture that you're that you're working with over there. Um, you know, I love my PCC friends, and I and I love my PCC uh, 
uh, clients. And um, if you ever have a question, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm always an open book to anyone that's in the family of PCC. Um, so I'm, I'm here as a resource for you guys and want to make sure that all this stuff is very approachable um, for you guys to implement. So um, there is no excuse. Um, <laughs> so you have your resources over here with PCC's family, including myself, um, to guide you through any, any, any questions that you guys have. Good, good. Thank you so much. You're extremely generous. <laughs> yeah, well, it was my pleasure. And thank you for your time. I know time is valuable and everyone be safe and I salute my pediatrician. As a, as a new mom, I love you guys even more. Hmm. That's so nice to hear. And congratulations again. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch up with you next time. Bye, everybody.